Uh, welcome. Thank you for showing up. So today I am going to be talking to you guys about the importance of BIPOC leadership in STEM. And so this is more of an interactive discussion-based lecture. So while I will be providing some of my opinions and some of the research that I've done into this topic, uh, what we end up learning and taking away from it by the end will also depend on the feedback that we get from you guys, because you guys are, of course, the next generation of BIPOC leaders. And so your voice and your opinions and your lived experiences matter. So I thought it would be good to kind of start out with a test of prominent scientists that have left their mark in our understanding of science and philosophy. So let's start with our first one. Does anyone know who this is? Scream it out if you know who this is. Come on. It is terrible audience participation. I know you know who this is. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we're, we're getting there. How about this one? So this one is more focused on biology as given away by the finches there. Shout out. Darwin. Yeah. Darwin. Was there someone that didn't know who this was? So we all knew this was Darwin. Don't be shy if you didn't know who it was. It's okay. <laughs> How about this? So now we're moving more into climate activism. Does anyone recognize her? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so how about this person? Another prominent scientist who left their mark on how we understand science. Anyone know this person? I just want to make sure this is not the audience participation, so I'll give you guys another second. <laughs> and I'll open it up to the, to the researchers in the back. I don't know who it is. Yeah. Yeah. Raise your hand if you don't know who it is. Yeah, so this is, and I'll be honest, I didn't know either. Uh, so this is Charles Henry Turner. So he was a renowned scientist at the time, so around the late 1800s. And he was very influential in his ideas about animal behavior and cognition. So at the time, people tended to believe that only humans were able to creatively think or have complex thoughts and behaviors. And we tended to think that animals were more reflective. So they were more mechanistic. So they you know, would act a certain way just given their genetics and there wasn't really much more to them. And so he carried out these unique experience, experiments with insects and found out that insects such as bees and stuff, they would modulate their behavior based on their past experiences. So his work really influenced the way that we think about animal brains and behavior. So he actually got his undergraduate in the late 1800s and was the first black man to get his PhD from the University of Chicago. And his undergraduate research thesis, and I can certainly remember mine, so it was, <laughs> and I remember how terrible mine was and it really didn't make an impact at all. Uh, his ended up in science. So has anyone heard of the journal Science? So it's like the best scientific journal there was. And especially at that time, it was, very renowned. And so he became the first Black man to publish in science. And then by the time he was finished his PhD, so me and Melanie are at the stage now where we are almost finished our PhDs, he already had 30 publications. So <laughs> I certainly do not have that. Uh, despite that and all of the marks that he left with his contributions, Due to the racial barriers at the time, he was not able to get a job as a professor or as a researcher. And instead, he kind of did research on the background while teaching at a local high school. Okay. Does anyone remember his name as a refresher before we? Charles Turner. Yeah. Now you know. Okay. And he, like, he did a lot of things. He was the first of like so many things as well, right? And still, this is not like a face that we necessarily know. So does anyone know this one? I have faith that at least some of you will know this one. We'll open it up to the youth first, under 18. <laughs> yes, but do we know her name? Didn't she pass away recently? Yes, I think so. Do we know the name? I'm gonna open it up to the back now. Do we know the name? Is it Catherine Johnson? 
It's Gladys West. And I actually mm-hmm. don't know if she passed away. She no, so I'm thinking she West. might, yeah, she yeah. I think she's still alive. So she was very influential. So she and she still is. So she was a mathematician and still is. Uh, and so anyone that uses GPS, the work that she did was instrumental in creating GPS technology. So we all use cell phones, we all rely on cars, we all use social media. So indirectly, we're all indebted to her for her work. And yet we do not know her name. Okay, third example, who is this one? So this is Helena Glawinga. So similar (laughs) to Greta, she is also a young climate activist. And her story is, really interesting and resilient. So she is part of the Quechua Serayaco community in Ecuador. And by the time she was born, so she's around 20 right now, uh, the government in Ecuador and her community found a lot of oil reserves and without consulting any of the community members, gave away 60% of the community land to oil companies. And so they've been battling with oil companies ever since. And because of course their livelihood, their culture and the environment are all being degraded. And so there's been active resistance throughout that time with her grandmother, with her mother and now her. And this has resulted in a lot of like ongoing violence and in some cases incarceration incarceration, and even death. And in 2000, like when COVID hit, her community was further impacted by a flooding incident. So this is just a quote from her that says, everyone knows that the people on the front lines have not contributed to the climate crisis. We have a sustainable way of living in an extremely respectful relationship to forests, rivers, and animals. We have always advocated for its defense from the oil corporations and industry, but we live with the consequences of what the climate crisis is causing. So personally, this is the type of person that I wanna see at the forefront of activism because she's representing intergenerational trauma, intergenerational resistance, and that reciprocal relationship with nature that she lives by. So as that kind of activity just goes to show, science often reflects the biases of society. So who do we see at the forefront? Whose names can we recall? And it often isn't uh, marginalized or underrepresented folks, even when their stories and their contributions are very meaningful and have impacted our lives either directly or indirectly. So this is interesting because we have this narrative that science is supposed to be objective. And I also wanna make the point that that narrative in itself is also something that became mainstream due to prominent white male scientists from the past. So for example, not to ramble too long because I can go on forever, uh, my PhD thesis looks at how we can answer causal questions from like observational data. And a lot of the statistics that ecologists are taught from the past were taught by people such as Pearson and Fisher who really tried to be objective. And in in their quest to become objective and see themselves as objective, they kind of geared our entire field towards doing statistics in a fundamentally incorrect way (laughs) that is actually not objective at all. So that's just kind of looking at the hypocrisy of trying to be objective as humans. And of course we know that science culture is objectively biased, so it's not objective. So for example, BIPOC and other underrepresented scholars and perspectives are objectively undervalued. So at this point, I'm gonna open it up to you guys to kind of answer from your lived experiences or what you've heard or what you know, and tell me why you think science culture may or may not be biased. Can someone maybe um, give us their interpretation or definition of the words objective and biased? Let me start. And pick one. Do you guys think that being a human trying to understand our natural world is necessarily something that should be purely objective or should it be influenced by lived experiences and different philosophies and can it vary with different people and fundamentally therefore it's not objective and either answer could be right both philosophies exist 
So Chinta, maybe you can give us an example of how something might, in, in regular mainstream science that we see every day, like hypothesis testing. Right. Uh, how it might not be objective? Yeah, how it might not be objective. So hypothesis testing is something that is something that was pushed in the mainstream. So we like when you hear of the scientific method, of course, there's more than one way to do science. And so that in itself is biased, that it's promoting just this one way of doing things. The next time you hear <coughs> your teacher talk about the scientific method, think of that. It's quite limiting because in the research I do and I've done, I've never followed hypothesis testing because I find it to be very non-creative because I don't want to go in with just like one question with one hypothesis because what I end up finding often can diverge from what I initially thought, right? So I like to go in with more of an exploratory approach. So that in itself isn't objective because if you're going in with your own hypothesis, you're kind of limiting what you think might be happening. So you might observe something and you look at the data and you analyze it, but if you're going in with, well, it's either A or B, I either have support for A or B, it might be C, D, or E, or all of the above. You're just not getting the entire picture. So I would say science is not necessarily objective. I think sometimes it can be, but I don't think it always has to be. And I think the process of doing it should be holistic and open to different ways and interpretations. Would you fall in the same category? Yeah, I think so. And what was the second part of your question? Objective and biased. I just wanted everyone to talk about those two terms and what they mean because our teachers so often say them to us. So who here has been in science class and their teacher asked them to come up with a hypothesis or a null hypothesis? It's good to yeah. drill this out of them. Like, it's just so <laughs> uncreative. <laughs> like, <laughs> everyone here is nodding. <laughs> and then the second yeah. part, yeah. Go ahead. Did you? Yeah. Were you just stretching? Okay. Don't stretch like this. Oh, okay. Oh, go ahead. Am I answering the question? I was raising my hand. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you've heard that before yeah. being taught. Yeah. Next time, feel free to question your teacher and just be like, hmm, the MTRI researchers and <laughs> the directors of Dawn told me otherwise. Uh, so the, I'll give a story about how science culture can be biased. And I think it's good to kind of start with personal stories, because of course I can give you a list of things that we know are biased, but I think it's obviously more personal this way. So I have two stories. I'm going to start with one and then I'm going to get you guys to share and then I'll end with the other. I'm not going to say who I'm talking about, but I'm going to give enough detail so you will never figure out who I'm talking about, but you'll still <laughs> get to know my lived experience. So this was sometime in the past. I was working under someone as a researcher, and it was a white male. And I remember him telling stories about how he really enjoys going to conferences. So he's really interested in both ecology and statistics, both of which he views as objective, especially like the math and statistics. I also really like ecology and statistics. Uh, so one time I remember him telling a story about how he went to a conference with his buddy and everyone was doing this type of math called frequentist statistics. And him and his buddy were in the other camp doing something called Bayesian statistics. And he, him and his buddy were like, look at these mainstream people doing frequentist <laughs> statistics. Like I really enjoy being Bayesian statistics, aren't they so wrong? And he was talking about how he really enjoyed that intellectual objective discourse about disagreeing with like the different philosophies and the ways of doing that. So fast forward maybe a few months into it, and I am taking a stats course that he is teaching. And so I go up to his lab, which I'm working in as well, and a lot of the classmates were a little bit confused because math can be a little bit jarring sometimes, especially if you go in thinking like, oh, this is, this is scary and I can't do it. So it's like, hey, blank. Uh, some of the kids are a little bit confused uh, to see you for next time or if you want to email them about it. And he was like, oh, are you confused too? And I was like, no, I think I get it. I spent like all night actually looking into this. And then the class before he had told me, he had recommended a certain statistical model that I should do given that my question, my ecological question. And I spent, I spent all night like reading a textbook and like looking into it. And I came to the conclusion that his model didn't really make sense given like what I had learned. And I was excited about it. So I was like, oh, actually, I think it's this way. This is like what this person was saying. This is what I read in that book. And we had that discourse. And he was like, what do you mean? I don't agree. 
And so we didn't agree. And then I left and I was like, all right, we don't agree. That's cool. Like I, he still didn't really convince me that his way was right. And I still read my book and I was like, that's fine. Half an hour later, I get an email from him. He's like, Sushantha, come meet me in my office. And I go in and I was like, hey, blank, what's going on? And he uh, told me to close the door. And then he told me, uh, he was like, Sushantha, you are so disrespectful. He gave me like a half an hour speech about how I'm disrespectful. I look at him weird. I need to learn how to how to speak to him appropriately. And then he told me I needed to see a psychologist. He was, oh, oh, also he put in the fact that uh, he started with, look, I don't want to hold you back on in your career. And then, and he's my direct supervisor. So he's like trying to, that's him being like, look, I don't want to be the person that holds you back, but blank, 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 and blank. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I just, I kind of just navigated that and I was like, okay, this is, this is a little bit beyond me. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I literally said, I was like, do you just want me to be submissive to you? And he was like, no, 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 that's not what this is. And then we kind of, the relationship was always turbulent like that, but I just found it really interesting that he tends to see himself as this like objective person that likes to discuss intellectually about math and how he disagrees with different people. And with another like white male buddy at a conference, he finds that very intellectually stimulating enough so that he tells stories about it. But then when I disagree <clears throat> with him while working under him in an intellectual space that I still felt was like discussion-based and respectful, I need to go see a psychologist. So that is an example, I would say, of how science is biased and often perpetuated by those in power who think that they are acting objectively because that's kind of the narrative that's been pushed through them. You look very disturbed, Chad. Yeah, <laughs> it's not it's not very very disturbing. <laughs> well, I mean, that's kind of, that's that's been a common, yeah. So I'll have, I have another story to kind of wheel that one in. And that's uh, like a common experience. Too. Yes. So there have been studies that have found that like, you know, established white male researchers, which are the, the most common type of researcher in science, tend to focus working with other established white male researchers. And so what you get is these groups of people that are publishing a lot, doing a lot of science collaboratively, but not including the perspectives of a whole bunch of other people. So there's lots of ways that this is a affected science. Like, for example, um, we're recently starting to talk a lot about how there may be differences between um, male and female organisms, but sometimes the female organisms are ignored because scientists focus on the male organisms. And so that's obviously an issue when you're trying to do conservation on a population. Does anyone have any other experiences or thoughts that they would want to share? I also have another story I can do if you don't want us to share, but I want to open the space up because what you guys say is also part of what we all learn. You can also say like, I've never thought about this and, you know, or I don't agree. I think science is objective. That's you're definitely free to say all of that as well. Has anyone had any developments in their community happen? And do you remember if your community was consulted about it? Like where you live in Halifax? No? All right. I'm going to move on. Do you want to share a story of biases you've seen in science before I go back to mine? Oh, there's so many. Yeah, just pick <laughs> one. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is more of a story about some of the problems that exist in science. And when you think about, you know, teachers often tell us that science is not biased. And if you're looking at something that's been peer reviewed, then that means it's like the, the be all end all. It must be true. But there's been a lot of um, things that have happened lately where, for example, there was a scientist at McMaster University who faked a lot of data. He made it up and people were going through his spreadsheets of his data and they were seeing one row would have a formula that just says like this row times two. And then all of that data would be included in the study. So he was kind of making up data. He was making a big name for himself. Um, 
And a lot of his papers still got through that peer review process. And there's a lot of reasons for things like this um, when they happen. Um, the reviewers were not paid, so it's possible they just couldn't put in as much effort as would be required. But oftentimes, reviewers are people's friends. Like, if you're small, you know each other, and you ask your friends to be your reviewers, which is not supposed to be allowed, but it happens. Um, and even editors can be biased. So there was another group of papers that were turned out to be completely falsified, um, published in a big journal. And it turned out the editors of that journal, as well as a lot of the reviewers, were somehow related to the student who was publishing these fake data. So you can't separate the human side of things from the science side of things. So actually my story does have to do with peer review and just to break, <laughs> has anyone heard of peer review before? You guys have heard of that term, like science should be trusted because it's peer review. Do you want to give uh, that definition? Yeah, so the process is you <laughs> write a scientific paper and then you submit it to a journal of your choice. And often different journals have something known as impact factor. And like the higher cited the journal is, the higher the impact factor. So currently science and nature are two of the highest impact factors. Those are like the big shot journals. And ironically, what we end up finding is most of the shoddy science goes in those journals because what those journals now look for is like sexy topics, like sexy findings, like who found the coolest things. And of course people go like, oh, well, maybe if I, only look at this subset of data, or maybe if I really stretch this truth, this can be an exciting thing. So all that objectivity that's supposed to be there is kind of lost. But going back to the peer review process, what happens is you submit it, and then usually the editor of the journal is assigned to your paper, and they find at least two reviewers. So these are just other researchers that are supposed to have an idea of your specific research. And then they give you suggestions and you work with the reviewers and then it eventually gets published after major and minor revisions or it gets rejected and you try somewhere else. Uh, so this is another story with another white male that I work with. Uh, I will say I strategically just end up working with white male because they have access to the most power and resources. And I'm personally trying to climb the ladder myself. So it's strategic for me despite all of like the microaggressions and worldviews that don't necessarily coincide with mine. Uh, so this person, again, I'm not gonna give up too much information and just to blend it in even more, uh, is also interested in ecology and statistics and also prides himself in being objective. Uh, and so he was once telling me that indigenous science, we're talking about indigenous science and he didn't even call it, didn't even like the word science being associated with indigenous and he was talking about how you know science is done a certain way and he was talking about objectivity and he was like it it's done through peer review it just can't be done through trusting like oral communications which is what a lot of indigenous communities deal with and so he was really stuck on this peer review thing but what i find really interesting is if i and he, this is definitely giving up way too much but he uh <laughs> publishes in very high impact journals. And if you look at some of his past works, they are fundamentally flawed. Like if you look at different people's articles, you can find flaws within them, right? Because it's just what they think is happening and usually to reviewers. I do wanna be clear though, when scientists do get together and they have consensus about something, that's something I trust. So if Scientists are coming together and they're saying climate change is real, COVID is happening. Of course, I trust that. But at this stage in my career, if I'm reading a, a peer reviewed article, it could be wrong. You know, there could be a lot, like you have to look at those things with a critical eye. And what I found really interesting is that he held that view. He's like, no, we can't let like oral, like that kind of culture infiltrate science and the opportunity that we have going. But one time uh, he called me during, while in the middle of a review process, and he was like, is this the right way to do the stats? And I was like, no, actually it's not. And he, and I was like, so are you going to tell, are you going to change it? Because he still had the chance to change it, which would have changed all his findings in this really high impact factor journal. And he was like, no, you know, like it's already through the, we're already in the review process. And he chose, he didn't even want to think about it because months later, when I approached him about the same topic that I had corrected him on, 
he still thought about the topic in the same way as before I corrected him. So it didn't even bother him or phase him to update what he knew. Or like, it didn't even bother him that he like published something that he knew was wrong. And yet he sees it as a subjective thing and he doesn't trust these indigenous ways of knowing to be included into science culture. So in my career path and in my experiences, I've just found that to be very ironic. It was just these people walking around like pushing this narrative as if it's like superior. When to me, I just see it as rather inferior. So that is just another example of how science can be biased and disproportionately impacts minority groups whose perspectives don't get equal say. I also want to make a note that initiatives that tend to support or try to support underrepresented students can also be biased. So one example of this is historically uh, affirmative action has been given to white women. So like money or like access to affirmative action things tends to go towards white women. Although it's usually people of color that get disproportionately stereotyped for that. Like they think, oh, like you're just here because of affirmative action when it's really like the white woman next to them that probably ended up benefiting from that. Uh, right now we have a lot of EDI, so that's equity, diversity and inclusion initiatives happening throughout like all universities. And one pattern that I'm seeing is there's like a lot of, so one of the examples from the previous examples that I gave also leads EDI initiatives. And so there's all these people that think they're doing the right thing, that they think they have the right philosophy, but fundamentally their lived experiences and who they are tend to, they still benefit from the thing that they think that they're trying to combat. And there's that cognitive dissonance that tells them, no, I'm doing the right thing. I'm, I'm the good person here. And they don't do that deep learning because they don't have to, because they continue to benefit, right? They benefit if they just say, well, look at me, I'm successful and I'm doing EDI initiatives. It doesn't really benefit them to look deep inside and think, oh, actually who I am, what I represent is inherently harmful, right? So they just don't even go there. They just, <laughs> they just keep on floating by. So that's something, that's another pattern that I find annoying, but that is something that I'm seeing mm -hmm. as well. So do you wanna add any other examples of how initiatives to support underrepresented people can kind of go the other way? Yeah, I'll, I'll give an example that's relevant to you all. So there are a lot of scholarships out there now that are specifically meant for BIPOC folks or people from certain groups, which I highly encourage all of you to apply to. And one of the things that we've heard is that um, the application rates are, are oddly low, lower than predicted. Um, and I think a big reason for that is that these universities are giving out blanket scholarships, but they're not helping people with the process. And it can be a weird application process that is you're not familiar with. So um, I guess I want to point that out <clears throat> that, you know, they're doing this initiative without having an understanding of the communities that they're trying to help. But I also just want to add that if any of you are thinking of applying for scholarships like that or any scholarship at all, always feel free to email the person and ask for advice. You can email us and we're happy to help you or review your application or give you a letter of recommendation. Um, and try and talk to as many people as you can to get that assistance, but don't be afraid to apply for it. All right, so moving on to the specific discipline of ecology. So another thing that we have to grapple with is the growth of ecological science as an <laughs> academic discipline is deeply rooted and embedded within colonialism. And if, if anyone's interested in Hearing where this quote came from, this is, you can type this on, on Google and it will give you the perspective article that's been published in Nature, Ecology and Evolution. So for example, like historical <laughs> colonial access for land, uh, for expeditions, as well as the establishment of field stations formed many of the foundational early theories in ecology. And these earlier insights were often used to justify both social and environmental control. So an example of this is early ecological theories were used to promote or justify rubber and sugar production as well as different forestry practices. And this often historically came at the cost of displacing or harming indigenous people from their lands. 
And throughout history and even today, we have a huge problem with discounting existing knowledge systems in favor of Western views. So just like one small example of this is we all have learned about like Latin names of species. So a species is usually given like we know of the common name and then we also know of the Latin name. And here's just a map of the world with different colors representing how many bird species were named their Latin names after a European surname. And this is often from a European person that felt that they discovered the species or like someone that was closely associated with this person. So you can see that around the world, there's been lots of bird species with Latin names named after prominent European scientists or their associates. And this to me doesn't really make sense because Almost in all of the cases, all of these discoveries were already known by the indigenous people and those species already had names. And often these indigenous names reflect a lot more information than the ego driven, I'm just gonna name this thing after me or like my friend. It had information about the bird's behavior or like the use that that bird had to the people that were depending on them. Yes. Why didn't they name birds in their own continent? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I think it's because probably the mindset that they go somewhere and they feel that they've discovered a thing, right? So they'll, mm -hmm. they'll go to a place where the discoveries are already there, but because they're away from their own continent and they're so ego-driven, they think, I'm in a new place, I've discovered it, that means I've discovered it for everyone and now yeah. I will name it after myself. But, is my working theory on how that occurs. Uh, so a small example of this. So this is, I think we spotted this today actually, uh, when Melanie took us birding. I think the Lincoln Sparrow, would you find that here, Chad? It was, no, it was okay. a shipping or a Lincoln's. But okay, it was one of the two. Either way, we found a sparrow and it looked like this. Uh, so this is known as the Lincoln Sparrow. So this uh, bird was discovered, in quotes, uh, in the coast of Labrador uh, by John Adabon, who's like a famous ornithologist, so a person that studies birds, as well as his friend with the last name Lincoln. Uh, and what they ended up doing was they shot this bird, and then the bird died, and they looked at it, and they were like, we've discovered this bird, even though this bird was known to people there at the time for a very long time. So I just find that to be like a pretty key example of just the mindset that goes into that. Like, first of all, you're going into an environment and you're shooting a bird and then you're discounting all the people around you that live there and their knowledge of that bird. You're not even asking if anyone else knows of the bird. You're just going, this is my friend Lincoln. And so now this is Lincoln's bird. And that's what gets passed on. And you can type in Lincoln's bird, Lincoln's uh, Sparrow, and it will take you to the Wikipedia page. Okay, so we've already touched on this a little bit. So why is BIPOC leadership needed in science? To me, one of the prominent reasons is because a lot of the problems that we're trying to tackle in science will disproportionately impact BIPOC people and communities. So an example of this we see recently is through COVID in our local communities. We know that Indigenous communities tend to be more, more vulnerable to the impacts of that. Another one that is uh, near to my heart is the current climate crisis. So, so you guys should be familiar, but no worries if you're not. So from the 18, this is a map from going from 1850 to current. And then these are just the CO2 emitted worldwide. And you can see the breakdown from the United States, European Union, as well as the rest of the world. And you can see that there's been an exponential rise in CO2 emitted worldwide. And what's interesting to know is if you look at the historical and current records for United States, as well as the European Union, each of these more or less is equivalent to the rest of the world outside of India, China, Russia, and some other developed countries. So it's disproportionately being impacted historically and currently by developed economies. 
And of course, we know that this has worldwide uh, implications for species, forests, uh, oceans, forests, and entire ecosystems. So we know that extinction rates have gone up, and it's actually projected that at two to three degrees warming, so that's about two to three degrees higher than pre-industrial levels, uh, it is projected by the International Panel of, on Climate Change to lead to about 54% of land and sea species threatened with extinction this century. Uh, we have entire ocean ecosystems being impacted as well. So coral reefs, something I study, at 1.5 degrees warming above pre-industry levels, it's projected now that 70 to 90% of the world's coral reefs are going to die off. And then in forests, you see examples of this in BC, we have increased fire seasons and increased droughts. And again, this can lead to entire ecosystem collapse. So many terrestrial, freshwater, ocean, and coastal ecosystems are currently near or beyond their ability to adapt. And so we can study ecology separate from humans, which is what we historically did and say, okay, climate change is bad for ecology and the ecosystems. But of course, now we know that this is inherently tied to us as well, because we rely on these ecosystems for ecosystem services. So for example, millions of people depend on coral reefs for their livelihood, as well as fisheries, which they use for food as well. And coral reefs also do provide tourism through ecotourism, as well as they provide protection against storms and other things that can happen on land. And this is just an example of how climate change is expected to impact uh, human health as well. So we can see here that rising temperatures as well as more extreme weather can lead to severe weather as well as air pollution, which can eventually lead to a lower quality of life as well as death. And then we can also see things such as changes in disease vector ecology, where we have things such as range expansion, so this can increase uh, our susceptibility to things like malaria as well as Lyme disease. So overall, climate change, bad, bad mm -hmm. for the environment, bad for us. But what's also bad is that it disproportionately will impact uh, BIPOC communities and people at a global scale as well as at a local scale. So if you look at the top figure, so that's the globe, and then we have uh, overshoot emissions. So how much each country is essentially how much CO2 they're emitting more than they should be. So we have gray being low and then we have dark red being high. So we can see that the US is doing very bad on their end and then Canada is not doing much better than that. But what's interesting is to compare this to the graph on the bottom. So here we're looking at climate change vulnerability. So which countries are likely to be most impacted negatively by climate change? So either through their ecosystems or through human health or both. And so what we can see is that there is an inverse relationship to the countries that disproportionately have contributed to the climate crisis and the countries that are going to be disproportionately impacted. And one pattern that I noted here <laughs> is that the climate crisis is happening across colonial lines. So the countries that were colonized, the countries that have disproportionately high amounts of BIPOC individuals, and the countries that have disproportionately impacted the climate crisis the least are the ones that will be impacted the most. Is this something you guys knew before? Do you have any thoughts on it? I'm going to demand some participation <laughs> here at this point. I want to call people out. Ben? Um, I mean, given like, that a lot of the areas, especially in the second graph, they're most likely to be affected by climate change blue, but also colonized quite early on. Um, it's really interesting to see because it seems like most of the uh, very developed countries are the higher producers, and whereas the and countries that are developing or um, are undeveloped are the ones that would be affected by it. And, um, and over time, I think hopefully we'll see that the developed countries will 
sort of you know, come back to even out with their carbon emissions, but because um, they're not affected by it as much, I don't know if we'll see them much of a change. Right. And that immediacy is like seeing, like being seen right now. So like in <laughs> August, I don't know if you guys have heard about Pakistan. So huge flooding and one third of it went under and that has been directly attributed to climate change. So again, Pakistan is a clear example of that where now they have to, they don't really have the resources to deal with that. I mean, who does with a third of your country going under, but they certainly don't because of their historical context of being colonized and not having that intergenerational wealth build up within the country and now on top of this they have to deal with the climate crisis which they did not really contribute to so that's a clear example of that uh oh, was anyone I'm surprised about canada's yes levels there does anyone want to think of a reason why canada's emissions might be so high and overshooting what we can be producing is that a hand or a stretch? Hand. Yeah. yeah. You go first. Uh, I'm trying to think of what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, the second graph, like the vulnerability, is that like just by chance or? <clears throat> no, it's it, calculated. But I'm saying like. Oh, I see what you mean. It's like, can you change your vulnerability? No, is it, it that is by chance. Like, it's where you are, unfortunately. Geographically. Yeah. Is it also based on like income? It might income? also have that, but I don't I don't think so. I don't think it's income related. Yeah. I think it is by chance that the, the countries that ended up being colonized, and I mean, there's a reason that they were colonized. They were like generally warmer. They had more to offer. And like countries near the equator, they're going to be experiencing climate change more drastically. So it is kind of by chance, but also it makes sense if you look at the reasons why it became colonized versus the reasons why it would be impacted by climate change. Ben, did you have your um, Just was looking at that. Would the emissions <laughs> in Canada and I guess most of Russia and the US, would that have to do with um, the oil industry? Yes. Yeah. Are, are those three the some of the largest producers? Yeah. I mean, per capita, Canada's oil and gas related emissions are extremely high. <laughs> So I just want to make the point, this is why narratives such as like David Attenborough's, uh, who pos like posits that it's overpopulation, that's one of the key problems, is very destructive, because then who do you end up blaming? You tend to end up blaming BIPOC individuals and communities. I've literally heard people say very comfortably to me, uh, like white men that think that they're an environmentalist, and they've said to me, if, no offense to anyone, uh, if only the Syrians stopped having so many babies, I think we could fix the climate crisis. So that is just the, just the wrong narrative to push, given what is happening and the vulnerability of different populations. And we know that you know scapegoating is a thing that can happen. And so that over, you have to be very careful when pushing that like overpopulation narrative. That's really not. I don't think that's something that David Attenborough should be doing. So that's my ranting on David Attenborough. Uh, but I don't just want to focus on the fact that we are disproportionately impacted. Obviously, the positive spin to this is that the perspectives we bring and the empowered perspectives in science and stewardship that we bring can create solutions for conservation and the climate crisis. So just as an example, uh, this study here, if you guys want to look it up, looked at the impact of, they compared uh, protected areas versus non-protected areas versus indigenous uh, led areas in Canada, Brazil, and Australia. And what they found was that, so here, let's start with Canada. Here's Canada here. This is species richness, going from low species richness to high species richness. And then we have indigenous lands here with the mean here and then the overall distribution here, uh, protected areas here, as well as non-protected areas here. So what pattern do you guys see when looking at Canada, comparing these three types of lands and the relationship with species richness? Okay. It looks like um, lands with indigenous stewardship seem to be doing 
better than non protect barriers than protect barriers. Yeah, and so that similar. exactly. So that is the general pattern that was found uh, across Canada, but as well as Brazil and Australia. So in particular, vertebrate species richness was slightly higher in indigenous lands than protected areas. And one thing to keep in mind is that often protected areas are placed in areas that are already selected because they're high in biodiversity. So even with that bias, indigenous lands tends to have higher species richness. So that means that their knowledge system and how they're interacting with their world and the science that they're doing uh, means something. It's effective. It's way more effective than a lot of Western science has gone through so far. And so a local example, somewhat a Canadian context of that, uh, is an example with the caribou in BC. So as we learned from our old growth walk from Chad yesterday, caribou like old growth forest. And what's happening in this population here in BC known as the Klinza sub subpopulation is the old growth forests have been cut down due to forestry as well as like the building of roads and other stuff. And this has led to that late succession forest, as you guys remember from this talk, mm -hmm. switching to an early succession forest. And what ends up happening is you get uh, an increase of deer populations as well as moose populations. And who likes moose, deer, and caribou? It's the predators such as cougars as well as bears. So then you're also getting an increase of these predators, mm -hmm. which has then led to the general decline of these caribou populations. And so caribou are really important for many indigenous communities, including the West Moberly First Nations you see here, as well as the Salty First Nations. And so these two are, we can term them the nations and they would like to be referred as according to this paper. Uh, and they've relied on caribou for centuries, for food, for sustenance, for livelihood, for cultural reasons as well. And so they've had a close interaction with them and so what I'm going to present to you guys is an indigenous-led conservation initiative. So here's a map you can see going from 1995 to today. And you can see this is the caribou population. So it's going from high to extremely low. So by around here, around 2012 is when there were around 30 caribou in that subpopulation. And this is when they started this indigenous led recovery plan. So this was led by the indigenous community members and they took three action steps. So the first was maternal petting and feeding. So this just means that you kind of take mothers and like pregnant caribou and you fence them in to make sure that they're not getting predated and that the calves survive. And then they also did predator control, mostly of wolves. And then they also restored the habitat. And you can see soon after this program started, you're already seeing an increase in caribou. So already by 2020, it went from less than 30 to about 100. So that is already a huge conservation success. And why did this work? Well, because the government and everyone involved worked collaboratively with the indigenous people who saw an imminent danger and had a vision for how to fix it. And so this collaboration and allowance to let indigenous people let lead actually led to very effective conservation plans. And they didn't just stop there. So around 2020, they also entered a partnership agreement where they are now protecting over 85% of that subpopulation the, uh, habitat, whereas before less than 2% were protected. Okay, so I just wanna give a more local context of indigenous science. So this is known as Eduakmatuk. No, that's not right. How do you say it? Eduakmuk. yes. Eduakmuk. Does anyone else know how to say it? How would you guys say it? Two I seeing. I feel like everyone says two I seeing, but I feel like we need to learn how to say that. Yeah. Eduakmuk is how I'm going to say it, but I'm open to a talk that we can listen to more and practice. Okay. So to I think, has anyone heard of this concept before? So this was created by, you have, where did you hear of it? Last year. Last year, <laughs> someone remembered our talk. Yeah. Okay, so this uh, was, it's a philosophy and framework created by Doc Marsh, Elder Dr. 
uh, Mi'kmaq elder, Dr. Albert Robert. Uh, lots of, has a lot of accomplishments to fit in there. Uh, so what it does is it blends Western science perspectives with indigenous science perspectives. And the whole idea is if you learn to see with both of these eyes, you are going to create a more holistic picture and have a better understanding of your world. So whereas for the Western science perspective, we tend to focus on hypothesis testing, data collection, data analysis, and model and theory construction. From the indigenous science side of things, we tend to focus on respect, relationship, reciprocity, as well as ritual and responsibility. So I'm just gonna give one ecological example of this. So this is the Slave River Delta in Alberta. So you can see it here. And in recent years, people have noted that the fish health as well as the ecosystem health has degraded over time. And this has been uh, mostly attributed to development upstream, including um, the development of oil sands, as well as hydroelectric dams that you see over here. So they uh, implemented two-eyed seeing to try to figure out what is happening with this ecosystem and if it is indeed uh, degrading through time. And so they worked with both Western scientists as well as indigenous community leaders to try to figure this out. And what's interesting to note is that the two different perspectives had two different ideas of how to, for indicators of ecosystem health. So whereas for Western scientists, they looked at things such as turbidity of the water, as well as fish, uh, fish external anomalies, such as number of cysts. Uh, indigenous science looked more at physical appearance of water. So they knew about the changes in water visibility or movement through time. And they also had more information on assessing fish health and aesthetics because they live more closely with their environment. And so they had more observations. Uh, whereas the Western scientists uh, relied more on data obtained from field observations, as well as data that they could gather from different documents that were published. So again, like peer review stuff. Uh, the indigenous scientists relied more on oral knowledge that was passed on by elders. And what was interesting is based on these different indicators, the Western science indicators indicated that the ecosystem health was doing moderately compared to past levels whereas the indigenous indicators indicated that it was doing poorly compared to past levels. So one takeaway from this could be uh, that indigenous indicators might be more able to detect small or increment changes in shorter timeframes. And this is something that's been shown in other studies as well, looking at population declines. Okay, so Jinda, what's the, what's the um, want to point out with the serious bias was here with the approach from traditional sort of Western science? What was the bias? Um, so they just didn't have the older state, right? So oh, because right. of like, yes, this oral they're looking tradition, at right. they had a stronger knowledge of what it was like before. And so we might be missing a lot of information about the sort of regular steady state before a disturbance, simply because those data don't exist in in our own documents. Okay, so now I'm gonna open up to you guys. That was my answer. So why mm -hmm. else is BIPOC leadership needed in science? I have one more answer after this too, but I wanna hear your takes. Mm -hmm. So we've gone through how we tend to be disproportionately impacted by a lot of the questions that we tackle in science, how our perspectives, of course, if you have different perspectives, it's gonna enhance the way <laughs> you do science and your results that you get that in turn will benefit everyone. Why else do you guys think it's important? Do you guys want to see more of it? Are you okay with the level we're at? I'm going to start calling people out if you don't say something. Shabbat, I know you have some thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I think that, first of all, um, the reason that like different perspectives in science have always been helpful is because of the fact that like not only like the last year we were talking about like the indigenous tribes and the whales and how they didn't know about the like population that lived under the ice sheets like not only is that like impacting us and our questions but then there's also like other species that we would have no idea about that are essentially going to be helped but i think also another thing is that like even looking at like 
an example like is this like program itself but when you have like BIPOC leadership that you can like essentially look up to and see that they're making a difference then you can also encourage like youth in other areas where that might not necessarily be seen so not only in like westernized countries but also yeah but also mm -hmm. in like um like third world countries or countries where this kind of like programming isn't really funded or pushed forward to show by population. I think I remember I I had to like deliver this interview on CBC like a couple of years ago where it was about this research where um like they did they asked a bunch of like it was more of like women in STEM, but they asked a bunch of like youth girls about what they wanted to go into and they were just like there was like seventy-five percent of them didn't want to go into STEM because they knew that the wage gap, like they would be paid less than the male counterparts, and that they had like already made the decision that like I don't want to go into STEM because that I already know this is going to happen. Like they didn't even think like oh maybe things could get better. You know that's a couple years from now. They just like because it was put in front of them, they just like agreed with it. So I think that like BIPOC leadership, like if we just even see people up on a stage that like kind of represent us, then it just pushes people up again. It gives you hope, right? Yeah, like if yeah. you see like a happy BIPOC scientist. Yeah, that you, okay. <laughs> yeah so that kind of uh, translates to this. I think if you have BIPOC leadership, then that will reflect their values. And one of the things that I generally tend to see is that BIPOC uh, people tend to value community. So whereas science is now currently structured as this kind of individualistic, unfulfilled to me, unfulfilling, like publish or perish kind of narrative. Uh, here are some examples of like Canadian BIPOC scientists and what they've done in addition to like their research. So they're renowned researchers, but they've also incorporated community. So right here, well, I guess these are just the non-Canadian version. So this is the minorities in shark science. Uh, and they are kind of like diversity of nature, but I think they're way bigger now. Uh, and they do like free outreach about specifically getting minorities. So they have a focus on women as well as women, especially women of color. Uh, they provide free programming to get people out in the field, learn about sharks. They have like internships, paid internships, and they have mentorship program that mentors uh, youth as well as undergrads and graduate students and kind of gives them the skills to get into shark science. And so I've been following them on social media. Most of my friends follow them on social media. You can follow them on Twitter. They're very inspirational because they're out there and this is what they're doing. They're like, hey, I'm a shark scientist and this is what I want to spend my time on. I want to spend my time <laughs> empowering other shark scientists that have that would otherwise not have that. It's really made a big difference to groups like this. So um, just as an example, I used to work in the turtle world and we're quite connected to the fish world and both of these... Uh, fields of research tend to be something we call old boys clubs. So it's a lot of men, a lot of uh, racist people, um, and they come in with biases and they like to prop up the most famous people and, you know, and they all think they got their from there. And they all, yeah. <laughs> shark science is very healthy right now. And we've seen so many researchers who are very diverse or are amazing allies. And like things like this have really improved shark science in particular. I agree, shark science is very healthy yeah. right now. Uh, yeah, especially like the younger generation. So like we have like white allies coming to us and they're like, how can we offer your services? And some of them are going to be collaborating with uh, BIPOC shark scientists at Dalhousie and they're gonna take 10 people, 10 BIPOC kids out into the ocean to tag sharks in a few months. So that's so something shark you can sign up for. Uh, yeah, so here's just some other examples. So this is a local one. This is Dr. Kevin Hewitt from Dalhousie University. So his research is in physics, uh, but he also founded uh, Imhotep Legacy Academy, if anyone has heard of that. Uh, so it's a, um, a program, like an outreach program within Dalhousie that does a science outreach to Black youth across Nova Scotia. And then this is Andrea Reed, an Indigenous scholar that is, recently got hired at the University of British Columbia. And so she really focuses a lot on two-eyed seeing, and she is now in a position where she can hire Indigenous undergraduate and graduate students and kind of train them in this thing and work with them as well.